so we had some talks yesterday. We'll continue on with that today. Uh, our first talk today is one of our tutorial talks. Uh, yesterday we did a tutorial talk on fuel cells. Today we do a tutorial talk on lithium ion batteries, uh, presented by our own Vin Kathishnathan, who will be uh, speaking to us about various aspects of various things, and we can look forward to that. Uh, ben Kat's been here for a few years. He's an assistant professor, brought to us from MIT from his postdoc, and then from Stanford for his PhD. So when you're ready, Ben Kat, welcome. Thanks, Sean. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll try and cover uh, fundamentals uh, of uh, non-aqueous lithium-ion batteries and then try to weave a little bit of our, our uh, research in. Before I begin, uh, I'll sort of give you a brief history of, uh, of lithium-ion batteries. Um, it, the first, at least the first architecture similar to the one that's used uh, today was, uh, was proposed by Stan Whittingham. Uh, in the 1970s. Um, this was uh, largely based on lithium metal anodes. Uh, in 79, uh, this of course a lot that happened in between. Stan Whittingham at that point was at ExxonMobil. 79, John Goodenough, uh, who had um, then recently taken a position at, uh, uh, at Oxford uh, in the chemistry department, demonstrated uh, lithium uh, cobalt oxide uh, as a viable cathode material. Uh, and then a year later, uh, there was a big hunt for a viable anode material, and Rachid Yazami uh, in 1980 demonstrated uh, a working anode uh, based on graphite. 1991, Sony and Asahi uh, released the first commercial lithium ion battery, uh, and then there's been no looking back. Uh, I'll add another piece to this, uh, which is John Goodenough, now at UT Austin. Uh, uh, proposes lithium ion phosphate as a cathode material. As a cathode material, uh, at that time, uh, it was a material that was not uh, very rate capable. Uh, that is, it was not able to uh, do high power. Uh, 2002, uh, there was a variant of this, uh, uh, nano LFP. Uh, LFP here just stands for lithium ion phosphate, and then uh, A123 Systems uh, was founded, and then A123 went on to. Uh, make lithium ion cells based on these lithium ion phosphate um, and then had a bumpy ride. Um, and I think those of you that, um, that would like to know more, uh, I highly recommend this book, uh, The Powerhouse, uh, written by Steve Levine. Uh, many of you have met him. Um, and I think it, it gives a very nice um, uh, summary uh, of the story for lithium ion batteries. There's probably a, a parallel history of sodium ion batteries where Jay Whitaker will have a prominent presence. Um, and uh, you will learn more about uh, that uh, when Jay gives his uh, tutorial talks. Okay, so let's begin. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and tell you uh, to the extent possible what we know about discharge and charge at today, uh, in today's commercial lithium ion batteries. Uh, based on uh, graphite and then different kinds of lithium intercalation compounds. Okay? So what happens when you uh, discharge the battery, the lithium ions that are residing in between these graphene sheets move from the anode to the cathode. That gives you energy because the lithium ions would rather be in the cathode rather than being inside uh, graphite. And so uh, you derive energy from that and then when you want to charge the cell, uh, you move the lithium ions back from the cathode back into the anode, and, um, and that requires a voltage driving force to push the lithium ions into uh, the anode, which they don't like. So uh, what we want to do is to try and understand three components, the anode, the cathode, and the liquid electrolyte in between. And so uh, today, my main focus is to try and give you principles and, and fundamentals that will help you in understanding how these processes occur uh, at the atomistic level. Okay, so let's begin with graphite. Okay, so graphite um, is uh, formed by layers of graphene stacked together. You can stack them up in two forms, what's called the AAA form. Uh, these black, uh, black balls are, are carbon atoms. And so you have these hexagonal rings, and you can stack them up on top of each other in the AA configuration, or you can stack them up uh, off axis, and which gets you the AB configuration. 
Now, when you have just pristine graphite, uh, it turns out that the AB configuration uh, is a little bit more stable than the AA configuration. Um, now, it, when you intercalate lithium, and this is the fully lithiated phase, uh, when you intercalate lithium inside graphite, it turns out that it prefers the AA stacking. Okay? So what that means is if you have layers where lithium is there, it would preferentially want to be in the AA stacking. If you have layers that are not occupied, it would like to be in the AB stacking. Okay, so uh, let's continue and look at the ordering of lithium uh, inside uh, graphite. And I'll, I'll, dis I'll describe a nomenclature uh, often used to describe intercalation processes in uh, graphite. This is, this is a stage one process. Stage one process is there is one layer of graphene between occupied layers of lithium. Okay? These big gray balls are lithium, and then you have the graphene layers in between. So note that there is only one layer of, of graphene between the occupied layers of, of uh, lithium. Now, stage two process has two layers between occupied layers of, of lithium. And then uh, note that, as I pointed out, the lithiated phase would like to be in the AA configuration, and then the empty phase would like to be in the AB configuration, and then you then get AABB stacking. Now, you, have, you can have other higher order processes like stage three, stage four, and so on. Stage three means that you have three layers in between. Okay. So um, now, in order to understand this, we would like to understand what are the intercalation thermodynamics. Um, and so let's assume that we take natural graphite, and we would like to intercalate a lithium ion and then it gets an electron from the external circuit. Uh, and then there is a concerted addition of lithium and electron together to form LiX C6. X here just means that, uh, that per C6, how much lithium has intercalated. Okay, so this describes the phase transformation that happens in the anode of a lithium ion battery. So uh, in order to understand these thermodynamics, the, the governing thermodynamic potential uh, is the Gibbs free energy. And you can write down an expression for the Gibbs free energy, which is the Gibbs free energy of the products minus the reactants. And so it turns out that uh, there are two quantities that are often difficult to compute. Uh, we like to compute uh, pretty much everything that we can. Uh, and uh, the two quantities that are challenging to compute are the free energy of lithium plus. So this is the free energy of the lithium plus inside the electrolyte. Uh, and surrounded by all these organic molecules, salts, and so on. And then the free energy of the electron coming in from the external circuit. Um, and so we need to try and handle the free energy of lithium plus and the free energy of the electron. It turns out that we have a convenient reference state, and the reference state is the lithium metal electrode, which is called the computational lithium electrode formalism. And the idea here is that you can relate the free energy of lithium plus and the free energy of the electron at a potential of zero on the lithium lithium plus scale to the free energy of lithium metal or lithium solid. Okay? It's very easy to calculate the free energy of lithium solid as opposed to calculating the free energy of these floating lithium ions in solution. So that allows us to simplify this expression into, uh, a, uh, into, a, into a scheme that looks like this, where this now is a purely chemical process. This is the chemical process of associating lithium and graphite to form LiXC6. And then you need to account for the change in the chemical potential of the electrons. And when the, chemical, when the electron is not at a standard state, the standard state in this equation is zero volts on the lithium lithium plus scale. So now all voltages are measured with respect to the lithium lithium plus scale. So this, allows, this equation allows us to then determine conditions for equilibrium for different phases of LiX C6. Okay? Each of the LiX C6 free energies will then lead to a corresponding equilibrium potential when the overall free energy change goes to zero. Okay? So basically that allows you to extract out what the free energy change, uh, overall free energy change will be and what is the corresponding transformation potential associated with that. Okay? Note here that here uh, x1 and x2 refers to two different, two different phases. It could be x0 could be, for example, 0, which is Li0, so which means you start with the pristine state, and you can have x1, for example, to be 1, which would be the fully lithiated state. All right. 
So let's continue. And in order to describe the thermodynamics of the lithium intercalation into graphite, uh, a popular way to understand this uh, is, uh, is a little like uh, filling uh, marbles uh, on top of uh, on top of uh, on these marble boards, and so you have lithium ions that you need to fill, and this is this is the the graphene layer, and so what you want to do is you want to fill these lithium ions such that they all like each other, right? So that's what you want to do, uh, and so uh, up and and the parameter that defines liking each other is the energy, and what you can do is you can expand the energy uh, in terms of uh, what's called a cluster expansion or an Ising model. Uh, all of these things are equivalent. Uh, and the idea here is the following. Uh, what you do is uh, you get a certain energy when you fill uh, the lithium ion in a particular site. Okay? That, that's often called what's called the occupation term, but that's basically the energy you gain by just occupying. Sigma here is just an occupation variable. So it's just 0 or 1 depending on whether you occupy it or not. Now, and then what you do is you get the energy for occupying, but that's, in the, that's under the assumption that the system is completely non-interacting, right? That adding another lithium somewhere to the neighborhood of another lithium has no effect on the occupation of that lithium. That's not quite true. So what you have to do is then account for interactions. So that's the crosstalk between these lithium ions and the, other, uh, the already occupied lithium ions with occupying new lithium ions. And so those, those cro that crosstalk is often quantified in terms of uh, nearest neighbor interactions. And so here it's an expansion to second order. So we expand it to nearest neighbor interactions. J here, uh, is, J here is the coupling term. And J root 3 A, for example, refers to when uh, the two lithium ions are, are root 3 A apart, uh, 3 A, uh, 2 root 3 A, and so on. Okay? Now note that you can also do this for occupation in between the layers, right? So you can occupy in one layer uh, below and then layer above, and you can extract out an equivalent set of uh, interaction coefficients uh, similar to what you can do for the in-plane interactions. Okay, and uh, Vikram has uh, painfully gone through this entire phase diagram to extract these interaction coefficients, and um, uh, I'll discuss what these uh, quantities come out to be, and I think it's quite interesting and it's quite intuitive after you understand these quantities, how lithium uh, will fill inside graphite. Okay, so um, this is for compounds that are greater than stage two, so basically there are no interactions with, uh, we assume that for any, uh, for any interaction beyond the nearest layer, uh, there is very, very minimal interaction because the distances are far too large. So what you have if you have a greater than stage two compound, so that is if you have two layers, more than two layers uh, in between uh, occupied layers of lithium, then only thing that dominates are the in-plane interactions. Okay, so the first quantity here, which is minus 0.8, minus 0.81, this is in units of electron volts. Okay, uh, electron, electron volt to, to kilojoule conversion is, is, uh, is roughly a factor of 100. Uh, so what you have here is, uh, to occupy a lithium, it's favorable, it's actually remarkably favorable to occupy a lithium inside the graphene layers, okay? So it's very stable to occupy the lithium, but when you try to occupy another lithium in the nearest neighbor, it's highly repulsive, as you might expect, right? You have two positively charged ions that don't like each other, you don't wanna fill them right next to each other. Now, as the distance goes further, the interaction becomes, or the, the repulsion becomes less weak. And then um, these two are large, these two are very close in distance. Uh, and then uh, when you go further out, that almost decays out, okay? So the in-plane interactions, uh, as you can see from here, are largely ionic in nature, okay? So now uh, it turns out that when you have a stage one process, right, when you have a stage one process where you have a lithium layer occupied on top, you need, to, uh, you need to refit these interaction coefficients, but the basic gist is uh, that they, these numbers largely remain the same uh, from what we had in the last slide. Okay, uh, now what gets interesting uh, is now for a stage one process, you need to understand the interaction of the lithium ions with the layer above, okay? And it turns out that the interaction uh, between uh, the layer uh, between occupying the, in the layer below and occupying in the layer above 
that interaction itself is weak. But note that the occupation term becomes uh, less strong. There needs to be a minus sign here. Uh, the occupation term becomes less weak compared to the occupation of a non interact uh, occupation of a non interacting case like we had in the uh, stage two and above processes. Okay, so with this we can actually fill out the entire phase diagram of lithium graphite. Um, one obvious point that I already made: if you look at the in-plane interactions, uh, it turns out that you can actually fit a very nice uh, relationship with 1 over R, largely showing that the interaction is purely electrostatic in nature. Okay? You can even extract out an effective charge from this, which comes out to be very close to 1. Okay, So uh, let's continue. And now with, which we, with this, we can actually construct the entire lithium graphite phase diagram. Okay? Uh, and what you, have to, uh, what you have to do to, to construct this, what's called the convex hull. The convex hull is simply a phase transformation between phases that are, local, that are minimums in the global free energy curve. Okay? What that means is if you had phases in between, right, all of those phases will be above the free energy minimum line that goes through these things, right, that goes through these points. Now, it turns out that you form a, a, a phase that is at about 0 0.04. Um, that's a highly disordered phase. Uh, and then uh, you have phases um, in between, which is the 1 6th phase, um, the 2 6th or the 1 3rd phase, um, and so on. Right? So you have, uh, you have very, very, uh, you have uh, largely hexagonal. Yeah. The error bars are uncertainties uh, in the calculated values within our density functional theory simulations. Uh, so uh, take them as known, take them as uncertainties in knowing where this point lies. This point could be anywhere between here or here. This is the one sigma bound for the um, calculated value for, for this particular phase. Okay. Um, okay. So you can then construct the entire Gibbs free energy of formation phase diagram from this is the pure phase, and then this is the fully lithiated phase, and you see that um, you see that it actually goes through these one sixth, two sixth, uh, three sixth, which is the one half, uh, and four sixth, and then um, and then there is this odd phase um, that is uh, just a little above, uh, just a little above point six. Okay, so from this we can then extract out the. Uh, from this, you can also extract out the entropy. Uh, the entropy is a little bit more subtle. What you have to do is you, you have to count the number of equivalent configurations. You have to account for the configurational entropy for graphite. And you also need to account for the configuration, uh, you also need to account for the entropy of lithium metal. Okay? And it turns out that the largest driving force for the entropy is actually the entropy loss from taking lithium ions from lithium and putting them inside graphite. Okay? That's a non-trivial entropic penalty that you pay. Right? And why do you care about entropy? Entropy really governs uh, the temperature dependence of these intercalation processes. Right? So when you want to run things cold, uh, these are the things that are, uh, uh, that are in your way. Okay? So uh, at the fully lithiated phase, the total entropy loss per lithium is, is close to minus 0.9. So almost all the loss is actually from the entropy loss from taking the lithium that was in a, in a much more entropic state in lithium metal than uh, in graphite. Okay. So uh, with this, we can actually uh, construct uh, intercalation diagrams that are derived directly from free energies. Okay. This is a really important point because uh, up until this point, the only, uh, only sort of analysis that was there was uh, largely based on enthalpy, not accounting for entropy. And entropy, although small, is really important uh, when you want to try and understand the intercalation potentials because they are determined by small energy differences. Okay? So what is plotted here is the voltage versus the lithium, lithium plus. Okay? Note that zero on the scale means that that's the equilibrium potential for a lithium metal anode to release lithium ions. Okay? So that's the process of plating, plating and, uh, and etching uh, uh, lithium metal. Um, so what we have here, this is the calculated curve. Uh, so the blue dashed lines are the calculated curve. 
Um, and uh, there are two sets of measurements here. Note that the disagreement uh, at the beginning is, is a lot more. And this is due to um, lots of um, parasitic side reactions associated with uh, what's called the solid electrolyte interface. So these are SEI reactions. So uh, I think uh, uh, phases beyond the, the initial phase uh, would be where we would expect better agreement. And we generally see that the trends are very well captured. Uh, the, the really important point to make uh, is that up until this, uh, this set of uh, predictions that, uh, uh, that Vikram had done, um, the, the best calculated theoretical intercalation, uh, intercalation diagram showed that intercalating lithium into graphite is unstable relative to plating. Okay? So that means that the numbers would go below zero. Okay? What does that mean? That means that thermodynamically, every time you operate a lithium ion battery, thermodynamically, you will short, right? That's a depressing state if that was true, right? Which clearly is not true. Uh, but note that it's actually very close to zero, OK? So that means that temperature dependent intercalation diagrams are really, really crucial if you want to understand the thermodynamic driving forces for plating versus intercalation. OK, so that's all about graphite. Next up, we'll move to the cathode. Uh, and uh, the cathode that I'm going to use to illustrate the principles of what happens uh, in a lithium-ion battery uh, is uh, lithium-ion phosphate. The reason, reason for this is that uh, this is just a, a wonderful material uh, that you can understand and model uh, really nicely. OK, so we want to try and understand uh, what happens when you, uh, when you put lithium ions into a host of iron phosphate. Okay, so it's now a little bit different from the graphite case. Okay, so all right, so let's start with uh, the Gibbs free energy. Okay, so Gibbs free energy will consist of two parts: the entropy and the enthalpy. The entropy uh, for filling lithium ions. Now, what I have here is a phase of lithium ion phosphate and then a phase of iron phosphate. And so, when you mix two compounds. Right? If you make, mix iron phosphate and lithium iron phosphate, you have a mixing entropy associated with that. Okay? And if you go back to your mixing entropy uh, derivation from undergrad, that just simply comes out to be x log x plus 1 minus x log 1 minus x, where x is the filling fraction of lithium iron phosphate and iron phosphate. Okay? So it turns out that there is one additional term that needs to be accounted for, uh, which is the interaction between lithium iron phosphate and iron phosphate. Okay. Lithium ion phosphate and iron phosphate do not like each other. Okay. So that means that what you need to do is you need to pay an enthalpic penalty. Right? You need to pay an enthalpic penalty to have iron phosphate and lithium ion phosphate. Okay. X is lithium ion, X is, you can take it either way, it doesn't matter. So omega here uh, is the interaction energy or the enthalpic penalty that you need to pay to have lithium ion phosphate and iron phosphate next to each other. Okay. So this is a simple free energy model for uh, what happens inside lithium ion phosphate. It's a really, really good model. And um, let's plot that same diagram now at two different temperatures, OK? Um, with some uh, set of interaction parameters that are typical. And so what I'm showing here is two curves, OK? This is G versus X curve, OK? So you have G versus X curve that goes like this uh, at, um, at a certain temperature. And then now, um, if you, uh, if you cool it down, uh, you will then have uh, a, a diagram that goes like this. Okay? Note that this now, uh, this free energy diagram, if it has to follow this, violates second law of thermodynamics because dou G dou X is, uh, dou G dou X is, is positive in this domain. So what it would do is it would rather phase separate. So if you take a point here, it would rather phase separate uh, into a phase here and a phase here. Okay. So this is what's called spinodal decomposition. It's exactly the same way a vapor liquid equilibrium works. Okay. So what you do is you start out from the liquid phase, and then you can change the specific volume. You can increase the specific volume, and then what would happen is at some point you would no longer have just liquid, but you'll have a combination of a liquid and a vapor. Okay. It's the exact same way that this happens in a, uh, in a lithium ion phosphate uh, cathode. 
Okay, so instead of vapor and liquid, we have lithium ion phosphate and iron phosphate. So now uh, what happens is you have what's called a miscibility gap. Okay, in the in the region of the miscibility gap, you have a constant chemical potential. Okay, which is great because then that means that the voltage profile is flat. Okay, that allows you know all control systems to be built around it. Okay, so um, this is the same diagram, but now. Uh, the, the derivative of the Gibbs free energy, which gives us the chemical potential. And then from the chemical potential, you can directly extract out what the, what the voltage curves will look like. Okay, let's look at the, the red line. The red line, you will start out uh, by having to pay the mixing entropy penalty. And then once you hit this region where you will have spinodal decomposition, you will now have a flat coexistence chemical potential, just like you have a coexistence pressure in a vapor liquid equilibrium. Okay, so you have uh, you have a coexistence chemical potential during this entire regime, and then finally you actually have to pay the last bit, which is a, once again the configurational entropy now for fully filling, as opposed to initially starting to fill here. Okay, all right. So this was the voltage curve. Uh, how does that compare to experiments? Uh, it actually compares really well when you take a, a low uh, or a slow discharge. This is a discharge curve. Uh, C rate is simply how fast. Right, higher the C rate, uh, that just means that you're uh, discharging the cell faster and faster. When you have uh, a very slow discharge, like the 2C discharge, you actually see uh, predictions very close to what we predict. Note that the chemical potential and the voltage, this will be inverted because uh, uh, there's a negative sign between the chemical potential of the cathode and the total voltage. So you have this flat voltage window, and then you have a drop here which is associated with fully filling and a drop here, which is associated with beginning to fill. Okay. All right. So this is the, this is now the equilibrium prediction. Okay. Uh, what happens when you account for non-equilibrium effects? Okay. What is non-equilibrium? Non-equilibrium is to try and, uh, and try and do this process at finite rate or do this in a finite time. Okay. So in order to do that, uh, we need to account for a rate dependence. And one expression that is popularly used is what's called the butler walmer expression. Uh, Sean talked about it yesterday uh, in his tutorial. Uh, and so you can start with a simple formalism like this, where alpha is what's called a symmetry factor. And alpha is basically, if you apply a voltage delta phi, what fraction of that gets dropped at the transition state? Okay, That's really what this alpha factor is. And so if alpha times delta phi gets dropped, uh, in the transition state for the forward process, then by definition, it's one minus alpha for the other process because the sum should be overall delta phi. Okay, so you can incorporate rate dependence or the non-equilibrium thermodynamics uh, within a simple formalism like this. So, which means that now you have a rate dependence. Now, what that what happens is, as a result, you have a control over this delta phi, right? If you want large uh, if you want large currents, then uh, that leads to a, a corresponding change in delta phi. And now what you have is the chemical potential is the equilibrium chemical potential plus this non-equilibrium part, which is associated with carrying out this process at finite rate. Okay. So interesting things happen. The interesting thing is that in a process that you do not in a non-equilibrium way, you can start with the temperature and conditions where you have phase separation, okay? So you would have this, this constant voltage window. And then from that, in a non-equilibrium case, what you can do is you can trigger it to move towards a system that will not phase separate, okay? This curve now no longer has any region where it will phase separate, okay? And the reason for that is that the driving force required, the delta phi starts to get, starts to increase as you try and fill more and more. And so it starts to change the curvature of this chemical potential curve, right? And you know this has been experimentally um, uh, shown also that you can trigger this non-equilibrium uh, phase transition into a solid solution. Uh, solid solution is simply a, a mixture of these uh, iron phosphate and lithium ion phosphate phases. Okay, uh, and you can take that same framework and then analyze this for different C rates, and it actually compares. It compares really well uh, with the experimental predictions that uh, that I had shown earlier. Okay, so uh, let's add a little bit more complexity. Okay, uh, the next complexity to add is what's called the coherency strain, and the coherency strain uh, is 
that when you try and match these interfaces, okay, so this is, this is a diagram of how uh, iron phosphates and lithium iron phosphates uh, arrange themselves. And what happens here is there are streaks of iron phosphate, lithium iron phosphate. Okay? And so what happens uh, in systems uh, that have, uh, that like certain kinds of preferential boundaries, what that means is that the surface energy of iron phosphate and lithium iron phosphate uh, are compliant in certain directions. Okay? So that means that they like to you know, streak along certain planes. And so a simple model with which you can understand the coherency strain uh, is an elastic term, right? just like we would write uh, in linear elasticity. So you just have an x minus x square, right? xa here uh, refers, to, um, refers to the fraction that you are at, and x square simply is any other location that you are at. And with this, you can once again tune this phase diagram. Okay? So it actually turns out that the location of uh, phase, uh, location of phase separation could change, so you can shift the window. So you could have a miss missability gap that was really large, and then you can bring that down. But there's another thing that changes, and the, that, is that, the, that is the coexistence chemical potential. Now, in the case where you did not have coherency strain, the coexistence potential was constant across the entire window. Now the coexistence potential turns out to be linear because the overall Gibbs free energy is quadratic. So you have a coexistence chemical potential that turns out to be linear. Okay? And these are things that are uh, observed uh, in experiments. Okay, uh, next up, uh, I, will, uh, I will transition and discuss about uh, electrolytes and how to think about electrolytes in the last uh, 10 minutes that I have. Uh, so we need a, a lot of things from our electrolytes. Okay? It's, it's actually almost uh, depressing how many things we ask from our electrolytes. Uh, and the electrolytes I'm going to talk about in this talk are uh, organic electrolytes. Um, um, Zishan uh, and Pratik will talk about solid electrolytes. Uh, but uh, the things that we want out of our organic electrolytes, we need them to be stable against cathode. We also need them to be stable against anode. Uh, we need them to not give up uh, its proton, so we need it to be aprotic. Uh, we also need low vapor pressure, high lithium ion conductivity, good solubility, low melting point, high boiling point, high flash point. List goes on. Right? It's actually amazing that anything works. Right? It's totally astonishing. But we're saved by the fact that organic chemistry is so rich. Right? The world of inorganic compounds is about a million compounds. At best, right? the world of organic chemistry is probably a hundred million compounds. Okay, it's quite quite astonishing that you know compounds that you make with just carbon as your base element, uh, you can do more. Okay, so uh, what you want to do is you want to find a way in which you satisfy all of these things, right? And it's often very very hard to do an analysis or to think about how to satisfy these sorts of constraints. And so uh, one approach that, uh, that we've taken uh, in thinking about this uh, is to use what's called a descriptor-based approach. And the idea of a descriptor uh, is the following. If you want to understand oxidative stability, okay, if you want to understand uh, um, tendency of a solvent to be aprotic, what you want is you want a simple parameter that can be easily calculated. Okay? It's not going to give you exact predictions for any one material, but it can give you really good trends across materials. Okay? And it turns out that for something like oxidative stability, we found that the highest, uh, oh, non-toxic also, the highest occupied molecular orbital level uh, is a very good descriptor. This is, this is the highest energy state available in the solvent. And if you want to oxidize, uh, where that level is relative to where the cathode levels are uh, will determine uh, whether the solvent or the electrolyte would like to give up that electron or not. Okay, uh, so uh, oxidative stability can be described with uh, with uh, the uh, HOMO level, uh, the tendency of uh, a solvent uh, or an electrolyte to give up its proton is determined by uh, pKa, the acid dissociation constant, um, and then uh, solubility. Uh, you can describe solubility by calculating the free energy of lithium ion solvation, anion solvation. Uh, some of the other physiochemical properties you can either uh, measure or you can either you can uh, you can calculate. Um, 
And so uh, one approach to just show the robustness of such an approach, uh, this is a set of uh, data that, uh, that uh, Vikram used to screen for electrolytes that would make sense in a lithium ion battery. Uh, so we start with uh, a complete PubChem ID. And I should mention a lot of this work is done in collaboration with Martin Korth. Uh, then we, we have uh, Cosmo frac calculations uh, that give us viscosity data. Uh, and then uh, Cosmotherm calculations, which gives us lithium plus solvation, uh, flash point, melting points, boiling points. Uh, and then we have DFT level data for the uh, ionization potential, which is closely related to the, uh, uh, to the HOMO level uh, and many other uh, solubility parameters. Okay, so uh, a, good, uh, a good screening analysis needs a validation, right? And so the first, first validation is from this filtering process, we have to get back what works, right? That's really, really essential because if, you're, if your filtering process does not find what works, then your filters are not good or your calculations are not good, right? Both. Um, and so it turns out that this indeed recovers the known candidates, right? It, in, it recovers PC, uh, it recovers DMC. It doesn't quite recover EC because EC technically does not, uh, does not satisfy one of the uh, physiochemical filters. So these are the known candidates that uh, it recovers. But uh, what is really promising uh, is that there are about a thousand new candidates that emerge from this analysis. Which is, quite, uh, which is quite startling for us. Uh, I'll sort of give you some general principles of, uh, of what are things that work. Uh, Nitro-based compounds, they tend to deepen the HOMO level. Uh, Cyano-based, uh, it also is very electronegative, uh, uh, deepens the HOMO level. But if you add a cyano group, then often it adds to a weakened hydrogen uh, uh, in the system. And I'll talk about ways in which you can avoid that in the next slide. Uh, cyanoesters, they are, these are really, really interesting classes of compounds. Nitriles, dinitriles, they're all really, really exciting. Some of these things may not be stable to, to anode, right? You might have to protect them uh, at the anode, uh, but these are, all, uh, these are all really interesting candidates that are, um, that are quite good and stable against uh, high voltage at the cathode. Uh, and also fluorine-based uh, compounds, these are also quite interesting. Uh, I'll sort of give a few thoughts on what principles. Uh, if you have uh, weak hydrogens, if you're just now going to the, to the drawing board and then starting to build a molecule, right? So now I have these groups that I think are interesting, and then now I have to put a molecule together. If you have a weak hydrogen that is close to one of these electronegative groups, make it a methyl, and that will make it aprotic. Now, if you want, uh, if your compound, it turns out, has uh, an ionization potential or a HOMO level that is not deep enough, then add a fluorine or a cyanide group uh, at an appropriate location uh, and make sure to saturate your double bonds. Okay. Uh, so that sort of is the general set of principles that we are learning from big data. Right? So this is truly, I think, even, even computer scientists would agree that it's big data given the scale of data that we are playing with. Okay, uh, all right, so tutorial closes there. Uh, I'll thank uh, Vikram, whose slides I have stolen. Um, and uh, and uh, I, I should thank uh, Oleg, Dilip for uh, all the effort that they've put in, uh, in uh, getting the symposium together. Uh, and uh, you will hear from many others uh, through, the, through the day. Uh, and the other uh, important entity that I have to thank are our computer clusters. Uh, they make a lot of noise, uh, but they do a lot of compute, a lot of work for us. Okay, so Gilgamesh, this is a shared cluster with the John Kitchens group and Al Magahi's group. Uh, Yahoo, this was a donation from Yahoo. I don't know what it'll be called once the Verizon merger happens. Uh, Alibaba. Alibaba. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> and uh, and uh, our um, uh, the the last big cluster that we built, uh, which is called Hercules, and we have a new big, uh, which might be one of the largest uh, that we will have at CMU, uh, which will be a hybrid CPU GPU uh, cluster, uh, and that will enable us to do even more fun things um, going forward. And thank you. <laughs>